Vincent Rajkumar. I'm a hematologist at the Mayo Clinic and also serve as an associate editor for the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. It is my great honor today to have uh, one of the legends of hematology, Dr. Carlo Bruniera from the Children's Hospital in Boston uh, with us today for an interview. It is a pleasure to have you here and thank you so much for offering to speak to me. Thank you. It's great. It's been a great visit and so uh, it's fantastic to be here. We are just uh, very uh, privileged to be interviewing um, people like you who have contributed greatly to hematology. And what we want to uh, do with this series is to educate our listeners into uh, how you came into this field. How did you accomplish these uh, amazing things in your life in, in the field of hematology and to learn from you? So if I were to start, I would start from the very beginning. You did medical school, uh, you, did, you did your schooling in Italy and then you moved to the United States. How did that come about and why? Yeah, that was uh, actually, you know, I, when I was in medical school, I started working in a lab, and this lab was interested in uh, red cell biology. And so at that time, uh, the New England Journal published some papers on uh, uh, red cell ion transport and essential hypertension. And so we started to try to replicate those studies in, in, uh, at the University of Verona, where I was. And so I started working in the lab, and learn how to handle red cells and then uh, um, we got in contact with the people in Boston who had uh, started this uh, this work and that published this uh, New England Journal paper and basically told my professor asked them whether I could go there for a visit and so I went in uh, uh, I remember it was May and for some reason there was some snow in Boston at the beginning of May and we s I spent the day with them and then they invited me to come uh, for the summer, and uh, and but I already knew that I really wanted to stay. So I, I came for the summer, hoping to be able to uh, continue there, and that's in fact you know what happened. So I work in, in the lab at the Harvard Medical School. My the chief of the lab was also the dean of the medical school, uh, Dan Tosteson. So was was fortunate to be in, in a great lab in in a great place and. Uh, and basically, um, from the work on uh, uh, on hypertension, really we went on to do just some more basic uh, uh, work on, on red cell biology and membrane transport that then uh, I was able to uh, translate into sickle cell. And, uh, you know, for the young people at times, you know, first I'm not sure whether I qualified for being a legend, but in any <laughs> case, the, it's a mixture, of, you all of course have to love your work and have this drive, yes. but also a mixture of also finding the right people at the right time and the people who give you a chance of uh, demonstrate your abilities. And so I, when I was working in Dr. Tosterson lab, I met uh, Frank Bunn, who is a very famous hematologist at the Brigham, the person who discovered hemoglobin A1C and has done some of the most seminal work on hemoglobin structure function. And he told me of this rare anemia, hemoglobin CC disease, in which he thought that there were some problems with the transport of iron across the membrane. And from that um, meeting, and also he happened to have some money, so he had some funds for me to, to work on this project. And from that, I transitioned into more of a, anemia and red cell biology and eventually in a sickle cell. So I think I was fortunate to be at, at, at that point having these two uh, exceptional mentors who gave me the opportunity to, to start my work. Mm -hmm. that's a, a, but that's an amazing journey. When you were a medical school student in Italy, you already knew you wanted to do hematology and come to the U.S. I think I wanted to come to the U.S. Yes, and then I was interested in hematology. So and uh, and so, w when I finished medical school, I, I took all my exams that you had to take to to get your degree for the U.S. And then, uh, when I, after I started my work there, and it's funny, I got my first R1 in 1986. So. But that time was easy. It was not as difficult as today. So, but I got my first R1, so I was uh, 32 in, in 1986. And then at the same time, I started 
training at the Brigham in, uh, in laboratory medicine and I did the half research and half training for the next two or three years. And Had you I, done uh, residency type training in Italy before you came I here? just did a few, I did a, a six months of internal medicine That's and it. then I went into more doing more research. So yeah, then I, uh, then I did, you know, lab medicine and uh, transfusion medicine at the Brigham. Wow, wow. Now, you, uh, you, how would you describe your residency days uh, in Harvard Medical School and in, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital? Again, you know, the, the, the third person who was key uh, was uh, the chair of pathology at the Brigham, Dr. Ramsey Cotran. And he was obviously a legend in yes. pathology, the Cotran, uh, uh, Robert Cotran textbook. textbook uh, uh, and he also was a person who had uh, uh, the capability of seeing people and giving them a chance to, to, uh, to become successful. And so he said, you need to do a residency and why don't you do clinical pathology at the Brigham because that's uh, great for you. And I said, yes, but you know, I have a research lab and you're sending your clinical pathology residents across the city to the West Roxbury VA. Okay. And so I said, can I do my residency at the Brigham? And he said, well, nobody's done it, but if you want to try, why don't you do it? So he gave me the opportunity, so I basically arranged my own rotations in 1986, to, you know, blood bank, microbiology, chemistry, and hematology. And then uh, after that, he said, well, you know, now that you have arranged it, why don't you take care of all the other residents that now they all want to do the same thing that you did or they are more just incipient so for uh, five or six years until David Sachs took it over I basically run and grow the CP program uh, wow. so that we started having people who first doing APCP but then only doing clinical like pathology, pathology. That now. That one of the first. Yeah that was the first so you know that has become very successful because we get People were interested in doing research and doing, you know, clinical pathology clinical and research. Pathology and that was the beginning of the wow. clinical pathology of the Brigham. Now, again, uh, another thing that is uh, really fascinating when I pursue, pursue, uh, pursue your CV is that uh, you, from by all accounts, did your residency and finished your residency only in 1990 and yet you were a full professor at Harvard by 2002. I mean, that is just yeah, unheard uh, of. It, yeah, I was uh, among the young ones, yes. Uh, you know, the... 12 years from... Yes, because, you know, I was assistant in 86, but you're right, I think was I was fortunate, you know, and again, it's a matter of, I think, you know, if I had to give credit to all people that at different levels, you know, the mentorship, you know, the mentorship uh, people of the NIH, that at the time, you know, I had a grant uh, that wasn't really in the, in the pay line, and people say, well, no, let me help you. They found a way to uh, have it uh, funded for me. Uh, uh, David Batman was a guy at the NIH who was exceptionally supportive. So I think, you know, the success certainly comes from, from, from you. But I think also the ability or the fortune of having these people around you who help you to make it happen. And so I found, you know, the people at NHLPI and NIDDK that were really exceptionally helpful in helping you to get funds for your research. Yeah. And then so everything, all these little components came together to make it a successful academic career. What do you think would be your um, like top three best papers that you are very proud of uh, in your research area. I well, know you've done a lot of work, so it's hard to. Yeah, no, I think you know the. the or at the, least one or two, whichever one you can. You know, I think the the my uh, first and only science paper in 1986 was great because uh, even my boss said, "Well, I'm not really sure the science will take it," and then they ended up taking it, and so I thought it was the first. Uh, that they showed this uh, transport abnormality in uh, in sickle cell. Wow. And then uh, I, the work that I did with um, uh, recombinant erythropoietin and looking at functional iron deficiency, I thought that was also fun. I did a lot of work with Margaret Kraskel, who unfortunately passed away prematurely, but she was the director of the blood bank at the Beth Israel. 
and Marco, a very, very good friend. So again, I was fortunate to have... Uh, and where was that paper published? Uh, that was published in, uh, in Blood. Oh, wonderful. Yes, and, and that was nice. And then uh, my third one, you know, we'd, we've done a lot of uh, mouse work. Yes. And so I think uh, the, the very first paper that was published in the American Journal of Physiology, of Physiology that showed the presence of this specific ion transport, the, the KC alcohol transport in the mouse, uh, was great because a lot of people uh, believe that the, that, that the mouse actually did not have this uh, specific transport. Uh, and we were able to show that actually was there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's, that's so incredible. I mean, uh, all that you've said so far in terms of, you know, how you worked hard and, and how much uh, uh, mentorship and the good fortune of having, having good mentors um, help you and then all the accomplishments. If, if that was all, you would already be a legend. But you also took on another challenge. Uh, you went ahead and became editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Hematology, uh, a journal that's been around for like 60, 70 years. This is, a, this is another full-time commitment and you've been leading it for over 10 years. Yeah. Uh, what, how did you become an editor-in-chief of a, of a major uh, hematology journal? So again, you know, that's, uh, I was fortunate to have this very good friend and colleague, uh, Matthew Steinberg, and he approached me because he was in the editor selection committee and said, you know, why don't you consider this job? And I said, Matt, I mean, you know, this is a terrible draw now. When I send my papers in, it takes a year to get published. And he was very patient. He said, well, you know, but think about it. I think it would be good for you. And, you know, Matt is it's first a very good friend. Also, he has been around for a long time. He's very knowledgeable. And, and so I think he saw, before I actually saw it, that this would be good for me and said okay I think you you know I'll, uh, so I applied and I got selected and uh, and then I started you know the journal wasn't in, it wasn't a transition phase so I had to put a lot of work in and uh, also being able to recruit people in, in this associate editor I think that was a, a privilege of being able to interact with some of these great people and have them come on board for the journal so yeah. I think that's what I uh, and it's again, it's an effort of all these editors and and some of the um, authors who you know believe in the journal or personally trust you and and send you their work. So I, it's been a long process, but yeah, I think I've been very happy. And uh, so I have a question listening. for you, as you know, I'm part of the Mayo Clinic proceedings, and uh, in terms of just advice, I mean, most journals want to have a very high impact factor. And how does that, how do you look at impact factor as a metric and do you go after it? Or what are the pros and cons? Uh, any advice you would have for other editors or people like me? Yeah, I think, you know, unfortunately, that's the metric that seems to be used for assessing success of a journal. And I think, you know, it's unfortunately that we don't have any other measure in which we can say that we are making an impact and making a difference. So. It's inevitable for editors to try to work on the impact factor, and uh, by actually publishing fewer papers or whatever to try to help it. But I think you know, if you look at a different dimension and, and saying, how is my journal going to make a difference for clinicians and for people are practicing the field, then I would say you know, a journal like the Mayo Clinic proceeding is perfectly suited to have this right balance between impact factor and really making a difference in having clinicians every day picking up the journals and reading an article and, and finding something useful for the practice. So, you know, for the American Journal of Hematology, it's a smaller journal, more limited in scope, but for a journal like the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, I think you're in a unique place to be able to marry the scientific a metric of having a very good impact factor, but also the fact that you have a readership out there who might not cite the journal scientifically, but is actually using it every day in the practice, or they find pleasure in just reading the article. Yeah. So not uh, not good ways to measure this other yeah. side, but it's, it's very equally yeah. important. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Uh, that's great. It's just been great uh, chatting with you. What advice would you give? 
to young faculty, medical students, residents who are writing to publish in journals? Any advice you would give? Uh, because the fear of publication, fear of rejection by, uh, by a journal is there. Uh, any tips uh, that you would like to share? I think, you know, the, the, the having a mentor that helps you in this initial phases of uh, um, refining your thinking and uh, knowing how to make a specific point, how to present your data, and how um, and helps you in, in the, the various draft. I think that, for me, has been key in, um, in learning how to write. So there's obviously a lot of material out there that helps younger people uh, but I, in my mind, there's nothing like sitting down with a senior person and really having him or her giving you advice on why the sentence or why the structure of the paper should be done differently. And I think that's where I learned the most. It's really, you know, at times you have people who uh, I had one of my mentors had red marks all over it. And, and it was a little challenging, but they were all helpful. So you might get discouraged at the beginning because you see that you have to do a lot of correction, but I think it's all for a good cause. So okay. I think that, and then, you know, being foreign born, there's always the the language, language. and so I think that's a, an additional challenge for people who are not uh, English speaking at the beginning, and so that requires, you know, more attention to the grammar and the typos and that, but uh, I think the mentor in my mind is key. Okay. And, uh, on a concluding note, where do you think hematology is uh, heading and uh, with all this explosion in, in our ability to actually sequence the whole uh, DNA of, uh, of, of our patients uh, and precision medicine, where do you think hematology is it as exciting to you now? And I think so. You know, it's, uh, first of all, you know, I'm more limited uh, because I'm, I'm not in the oncology, but I'm in the benign hematology. But even for that, I mean, you know, with the with all the additional insights that, that we have in uh, even single gene disease in which now we have all these disease modifiers. Uh, I think it opens up so many new pathways, both uh, uh, of understanding the basic physiology as well as understanding the translational potential of some of these targets that I think really the next phase is going to be as rewarding as the prior one but uh, at a different level in which we're going to have more kind of individualized approaches, but still so much insight into disease biology that which we still don't know much about. And so I think it's going to be exciting. And so I think for young people, you know, being able to marry the clinical with maybe more of the molecular biology, I think is going to be a great uh, career. So I always, I always recommend that, you know, either hematology or love medicine, clinical pathology. I think they're great careers. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for taking time off your busy schedule to speak to the proceedings. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Brunyara. Uh, we thank you for watching. Thank you. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.